R.I.P. Jerry Taylor, Star Trek's mom, uh, and an unboxing. Today on Trekland Tuesdays Live, number 374, with me, Dr. Trek, Larry Nemechek, coming at you here from the heart of Trekland and the home of treklandtreks.com, which can be your unique away mission here around Southern California at actual Star Trek location sites that you pick out with my help and visit with my help. Yes, all of that. And here we are once again on a Tuesday coming at you for some sanity, clarity, and a bigger picture in all things Star Trek. It feels like a momentous Tuesday, but look, we got Lower Decks back finally for eight more weeks. And if you hadn't seen my new second opinion, it's up. So go over and tell me what you think. Uh, two shows for the price of one this time, two episodes. And then we'll be here every week through the rest of Lower Decks until next January when Section 31 premieres. So yes, so there is actual Trek happening, heading into the holidays. It's football season here in the States. It's campaign season next week. And in the middle of all that news, we had some sad news. In fact, I'm just going to interject here. We have a doubly sad news. I just tweeted about this a little bit ago, but today brought the news that Terry Garr has passed. Terry Garr at 79. Now, the headlines will all say she was young Frankenstein and Tootsie and yada, 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 and Close Encounters and all of that. But, of course, we know her as Roberta Lincoln. And as I said, the co-star of the original Star Trek completely failed pilot, failed spinoff. That's what we should say. From Assignment Earth, she was Roberta Lincoln with Gary Seven. We were being companions to meddling people from an advanced species, advanced uh, culture, before anybody in the States knew what the hell Doctor Who was. Now, Terry was great. The irony of Terry is that she turned her back on her Trek legacy. I think maybe she was tired of talking about it. Maybe it came at a time when she wanted to focus on everything else and didn't want to get proceed to be sucked into the Star Trek crazy with the Star Trek kids from that time and place, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s. And also a little bit burned by the infamous story of on set, supposedly, Jean ripping her her skirt down to make, make it more of a mini skirt. It's not quite a micro mini, but getting there. So whatever, whatever the reason experience was, she was never keen to talk about Star Trek, but we honor her Nevertheless, and wonder if NBC or anyone else had actually picked up Assignment Earth for a series, what would it even have looked like? What would, it, what would it even have looked like, that backdoor pilot? So, yes, R.I.P. Terry Garr, 79, multiple sclerosis, diagnosed, I think, around 99 and lived with it all this time. Amazing, amazing. Continue to act some after she was. And worked as a spokesman for the multiple sclerosis society but today aside from an unboxing later today i'm going to talk about uh, someone very near and dear to me that was great to see again just in recent years jerry taylor and as i prepare to do that i want to say which i neglected to do welcome to everybody if you're watching us later on youtube just bear in mind you can still leave a comment glad to have the conversation still going but it'd be great if you could leave if you could join us someday live tuesday one ish <laughs> pacific for ish eastern and even nine ish uh central europe uh nine ish uk time and ten ish central europe so jerry taylor now look most of the biographies started with Star Trek for once. Star Trek was kind of the capstone of her career. It's what she retired from and finally got it through her head <laughs> these last few years that it was an amazing legacy that in the years since she had retired and just paid attention to family, thought she'd paid her debt to Star Trek, had no idea how much the impact of Janeway and Seven and Bellana and everything Voyager, how much that it had on fandom and how much that it had on so many young girls and so many um, not so young girls as they grew older and got into careers and all that. The Janeway effect, and, and Kate is around, Kate Moger is around to acknowledge that. Kate's, you know, she's in a play right now about to open or has opened in New York 
her her life she has a life beyond star trek but she knows what a big chunk it's been for her and she's very cognizant i mean there's a statue of janeway a bust right got all the so that all goes back to the mother of voyager the co-mother the co-creator of voyager with mike and rick uh, mike pillar and rick berman and certainly the spiritual godmother of Janeway. That's partly why the guys, even in 1994, wanted to make sure once that decision was made to have a woman be part of the core team. And it sounds ridiculous to say that now with the advances we've had, but even in the 90s, it was something. But here's the thing. Jerry was so humble and so down to earth, yes, but she was so humble and so self-unassuming. This woman was a quiet revolution in Hollywood that didn't didn't get up and scream and grab the attention and the headlines and all the accolades and all of that. Yes, she was born, right, born in Bloomington. She was 86 when she passed last week with family close by her son, Andrew. Now, here's the thing about Jerry. You know, she came to next gen before Voyager. She came next generation in fourth season. So she was like everyone else. She was getting a tryout. And then she stuck so well that by fifth season, as Michael Piller stepped back to work on other things like Legend, um, she filled the gap. And by seventh season, she was a full-side executive producer alongside Rick. And she was the showrunner. In fact, so many things come to mind here because this was right when we I was working on the Companion, the Next Gen Companion book for a couple of years. And then we moved to L.A. in 94 as Next Generation was ending. But I had a front row seat, not day to day, but a huge catch up once a year. And in 94, had watched the last three months of Next Generation come together and the spin over watching where DS9 was, the ramp up to Generations. It was, it was the most insane Star Trek year ever until maybe one of the last couple of years when we had so many projects going with new treks. But uh, that's all in Toronto and who cares? Here in L.A., that was the apex year for Star Trek activity. And counting Voyager coming in the door as TNG went out the door, but TNG had a movie, it was the biggest, bustliest Star Trek year. It was crazy. It was crazy. But in the middle of that, yes, before Voyager, there was, there was uh, Jerry. She had 30 episodes across both those Star Treks. Her favorite was The Drumhead which is oft quoted. It was a simple little bottle show, but she was really proud of that. But here's the thing, before Star Trek, how did how did she get her foot in the door? Oh, she was established all right. And you can look at the question. So she had worked her way up as a writer. She wrote for Magnum P.I., In the Heat of the Night, Jake and the Fat Man, all these long-running 80s series. And then she came over and she was a writer-producer on Quincy with Jack Klugman, or Quincy M.E. In fact, when I was introduced to jerry everybody the way people would describe her like fifth season fourth season fifth season sixth season people would all say oh jerry's a triple threat she's a triple threat meaning she was a writer and a director and a producer she had all those credits it's kind of like an egot only different but the thing was it was 92 93 94 and it was not a given that there were women working in all of those roles in Hollywood, much less triple threading it. I mean, if you see the Green Girl documentary, you'll know Susan Oliver had a very tragic moment after years of being everybody's go-to guest star. Never had a lead, but guest star, character actress. You could, I mean, and 50s, 60s, 70s. She wanted to, as many stars do, especially child actors women actors who are not done fairly by the Hollywood machine, especially in those days for people stood up for and, and championed this. Susan Oliver tried to pioneer being a woman director. She had a half hour on MASH and she did a Trapper John. Her MASH experience was great. Trapper John, the male crew mostly were just shit to her apparently. She never could break through that glass ceiling and that was probably 10 years Five years before Jerry was, I mean, things changed for the better, finally, by the late 80s. And that's when Jerry was enjoying her success here. Now, I have said all of that 
I have said all of that. But Jerry started in the industry. What was she? She was like in her 40s. You may have remembered, uh, you know, her sons, acting sons, uh, Alex and Burke, obviously on Star Trek, right? Alex and her son, Andrew, and, and her daughter, Gina. They, um, they stayed with, she was divorced and married to Dick Enberg. A lot of you remember the great NBC sportscaster. They had the three kids together, divorced. Uh, he had his career. She was not, not, not taken care of well. He was a high top, high flying NBC top line uh, sports sportscaster, especially in football, I, tennis, lots of things. But NFL, you'll know, did the Rose Bowls for years too. And Jerry basically had been a housewife and mother and raising the kids. And she, aside from all the accolades she got from writing later, writing, directing, producer, everything that has come to her from Star Trek, just remember that she was a. I don't want to say a Hollywood mom, but she was a mom with a star husband with three kids who, when she found herself with her own life, jumped in, jumped into this profession at a time when that was not exactly easy to do later. It was hard to do when you're that age as a man, much less as a woman. And that's why everything she did following that was so amazing. And she did all of it with this immense, just this complete lack of ego, pride in what she did. But she was so, so, so unassuming and so humbling. And, and for years after she had retired, five years into, four years into Voyager, she retired from the industry, turned it over to Brandon by then. And Brandon started with the fifth season of Voyager. And she had shared it. And even then the, the tables had shifted. Michael was part of the original team. Michael went to do Legend. Michael came back. That's how, and that shuffle is how Janet started working at Voyager. But she retired from the industry then and retired from, uh, you know, she had a much quieter life. She was just a quiet, unassuming soul. She had grown kids. They retired up to Northern California, north of, north of, uh, of, of the Bay Area and lived on the coast. And she did some community theater at, at home. Uh, her second husband, David, had come from the industry as well. Uh, his health declined. They had some health issues. He passed uh, in 2018, I believe. And But all this time, all this time, every once in a while I'd say, Jerry, let's do it. Let, come on. As, as this exploded the last 10 years, I'd say, Jerry, come on. There's a whole generation out there that has not heard from you. And she's like, oh, Oh, Larry, you talked to me back in the day. You've got hours and hours of interview. You know, I've said it all. That's fine. Which is a, which is a common thing you see at times. People that undervalue, especially if they're not, they weren't paid to be stars backstage. Lots of folks. And that's, of course, that's what Portal 47 is all about. But this is Jerry Taylor. And knowing the impact that Voyager and Janeway and all she did for a fan base that I didn't think she was really aware of. And thankfully, thankfully, of course, we're about to see it finally, but the Voyager documentary to the journey um, has is going to change all that just in time, I think. It's been great to see her captured on film and most of all to see her, her awareness grow of, oh my God, Oh my God, there's a generation that or two or three that needed to know her and needed to hear from her again, beyond like my audio tapes from the 90s. The cool thing was that at the same time, the cell company, The Center Seat, that huge 10 part series about the history of Star Trek and only Star Trek, 10 hours was being produced. And, and I was privileged enough to get called back three and four times because we never finished my settings. And in the middle of all that, I tried to help ferry some folks over to them. We did that. There are two or three people we warmed up with Portal 47 who were a little reluctant or a little unsure. You know, we're talking about retirees from the Berman era for one reason or another, undervaluing their contributions and all of that. And Jerry was all in on doing the documentary by that time. This came along too, and it's not like... It's not like some some people might have seen it as a competition or 
Jerry's going to be a surprise in the documentary. Do we want to give it a give it away to the center seat? I mean, that might be. But it's a kind of practical consideration. But good on her. Good on uh, my friend Lolita, who's you know Lolita Fajo, who's who's worked with Jerry so many years and still stays in touch, keeps up with her, keeps up with the family, and kind of engineered making sure she was part of the doc. David's opponent, 455 Films, and all the team there, and talk to them about making sure she was represented for the Voyager episode of The Center Sea. And all considerations of who's got her for how much. Look, Jerry was so overdue to be caught up on camera because no, no camera session, no five camera sessions. Sit down for three or four hours till your till your brain dead, and do that four or five times, and you are not going to catch up with all the contributions. There'll always be different takes. This is a case of the more we got her on camera later in life, the better. And yeah, there's interviews back in the day, Entertainment Tonight. There's there's bits on the DVD Blu-rays and all that. Well, wait, there's no Blu-rays yet, right? No HDs, <laughs> right? DS9 and Voyager. Where are the where's the upgrades? No, there's there's footage of her talking, but not like it is today. They're smart enough at CBS now to all the current shows. There's probably <laughs> there's probably gazookas of hours of documentary interviewing for every new iteration that comes. It's gonna be out there for years and years to come. So these last few years, yes, you can see her in the center seat. We were, I was able to engineer that and make sure she was able to talk for that in the beginning. She's on camera for the doc. There's all kinds of unused footage that may get utilized now going forward. So I feel really, really thrilled, really gratified to have been a small part of the incessant drumbeat. Jerry, you can't hide away. <laughs> Your public needs you. Uh, but I, I mean, one of many, many, many players. I'm just thrilled that first that and now the documentary finally yes i know people the backers premieres are early next month in la and then new york and london they're still working on how to get the voyager documentary out to folks it's coming it's getting there it is happening it's done she will be uh, in fact i understand that for the la backer premiere there'll be a special little spotlight moment live for jerry which is awesome uh, I said she was born in, in I hit uh, Evanston, Evansville. Come on, Larry. Evansville, Indiana, right there. Of course, went to Indiana University. She brought all of that to Janeway. Now, she got her master's out here from uh, Cal State uh, Northridge in the Valley, and, and life proceeded apace. The, the years that I was close to her, she was so, so gracious to me. In fact, Stay tuned to the Trek Files because one of the upcoming episodes as we end our 12th season there is a tribute to Jerry in a personal way because it was Jerry that bought our first pitch session story that turned into what became Prophecy, well, seven years later, and she had retired by then. And that's a long song. A lot of you have heard me tell that story before. But it was Jerry that we pitched to as a hello, as knowing me for a couple of years working and and janet temping and then going full-time as assistant script coordinator there never selling anything else to either show voyager or ds9 going in plenty of times having lots of nipples having some interesting outcomes from nipples but the bottom line is jerry wanted to buy it and got the okay from michael will always always be so gratified and grateful to her just another person she was so down to earth when we had been in LA for, and I'm telling her stories when we had been here about, uh, I don't know, from August to April. In April, the Oklahoma City bombing happened. And the morning of that, Janet came in, she'd driven in, had not been in touch with the news when it broke. And when all the national news, CNN and all the networks were going over to the local news out of Oklahoma City, Janet tells the story of Jerry coming into her office and saying, Janet, can you, can you come in my office for a second? And she knew, she knew we were new arrivals. We were still fresh from our Oki roots. And, uh, she came in and let, and when it was a thing, right, you weren't watching TV on your phone cams kids, but she had the TV monitor that they watched daily tapes on. 
And of course it was on cable. Anybody could watch anything. And she had turned it on to whatever news channel. And she said, I think you want You may want to see this. And Jerry just let Janet, I mean, I was watching at home. She just let Janet take a while, take an hour or two to just sit. They didn't worry about work. They weren't under a gun, but she brought her in and knew that she would want to do that. And that's just the kind of, that's just the kind of boss Jerry was. Everybody that worked with her, just as a, in a work environment, she was so caring, so nurturing. I mean, they're all trite adjectives. Oh, the maternal instinct and all that. But no, Jerry was very kind and understanding of everybody that worked for her. And she was very patient with everybody she worked with. And, you know, before that point, when I was first out interviewing her, everybody talked about, and Michael had kind of stepped back already. And all of Michael's new hires and then the ones that Jerry helped bring in, you know, when, when Ro baby Ron and baby Brandon and baby Narain and baby Renee, as she, I mean, um, they, people would talk about Jerry and the boys, Jerry and the boys. And she really mentored them. And they've talked about that. A lot of the public comments that have come out since. And she just had that, you know, kind of attitude. In fact, the, the thread before people were, were out here, we, there was a little in-house thread going around. I'll just read some of these. In this, there, a lot of people have, have made public statements. You've seen that. Brannon did in the guise of, of Aaron Walkie from Prodigy. Surprise there. Talked about Jerry donating all of her Trek scripts to Indiana's archives and library. And as a kid going over and looking at her hand annotated scripts and some of his first education. They're very, a very sweet, poignant little post there. Um, so Brian in this little in-house chain had said, what an amazing woman, what an amazing life. Oh, captain, my captain, may she live long and prosper. So Renee Eshveria, sad news. She was a great lady and a mentor to so many of us on this thread. She'll be missed. Andre Bermanis, who, you know, was science advisor for many years before he, he as he worked on writing and aside from the Star Treks uh, on the Orville, among other things. Andre said, Jerry was the first person who interviewed me for the science consultant job in 93 when Narain gave it up because he left to go do his own thing. She gave, Andre says, she gave me my first Voyager script assignment. Script assignment. The last time I saw her was several years ago with David at Sea Ranch, David, her late husband. More than any other single person, I owe her my career. She was truly a wonderful person. Um, Mary Howard, line producer who started off as director and then was kind of the budget and then line producer and now has produced so many series over the year beyond Star Trek. Mary said, Jerry was so special, a true mentor to all of us, kind, caring, and taught us all how to make it so, especially for me as a female assistant director moving up to producer. Uh, Michael Taylor that wound up working with Ron so much on, on Battlestar 2. Michael Taylor said, so sad indeed, but what a remarkable career in life. I'm sure it will be wonderful and some solace for all the people who work with her so closely and, of course, her family to see her vibrant presence in the documentary coming up. Uh, Ira said, sad news. Never heard a bad word spoken about Jerry. There you go. Dave Trotty, who was an assistant director, who's been a guest on Portal 47 twice, I think. Uh, said a very sad loss, but what a lovely woman and what a wonderful legacy she leaves behind. Your email made me recall her smile, her calm spirit, and warm demeanor, even in the midst of the chaos of production. One here from Narain. I don't think he's published it. He's posted anything publicly. He's a busy guy. Jerry was a great boss and a kind, patient teacher, a rare combination. <laughs> I have such fond memories of our time on TNG. She created a wonderful, nurturing, and fun room, and it was the best formative experience any new writer could hope for. She was a key supporter of me from the beginning, and I will never forget what she did for me and what she meant for my career. May she rest in peace. Oh, and, and Rod, Roddenberry, said, I remember her fondly. And you know, when uh, his dad was still alive, Rod was a PA early and, and mid-years on TNG. It says, I remember her fondly and passing by her offices as a PA on a regular basis. I can't believe we're losing so many great Trek people. Thanks for sending. So, you know, part of Michael Pillar's legacy is, is finding, nurturing, giving kids a chance 
young writers a chance and and deservedly so and on in through even the early voyager years brian for one and michael taylor was a jerry a, a jerry accumulation there lisa clink a lot of the folks from those middle years she was just a wonderful boss she was a wonderful supporter of everything nonfiction that i tried to do she was always so forthcoming in our interviews and if some of you have my you know my my they're just about sold out and i've not reprinted them but if you have one of the actual trek land on speakers here she was just gave her time the big annual end of the year sit down even when i didn't have a project and i, I and it's kind of uh, that's why it was so amazing when she retired once or twice we were going to go up go to the bay and then go up and see her and once or twice it just didn't work out it just didn't work out it was a long drive up to the coast up, up highway one pch and my regret here is that i didn't have more but so many folks didn't have more contact with her in the middle years right this last flurry the last four or five years uh for the documentary have been awesome and i'm so glad so glad that that's worked out the way it was but let me just so here's one back in the day i've i've shared this at times this was sixth season <laughs> yeah i know it's not a perm it's a body wave just needed some body but this is and of course aside from the the what she did she wrote the two books about janeway's life and then the cruise life mosaic and pathways but she'd also shockingly another trend setting thing she did if you look back here on the wall that's the cover for the unification novelization she was the first writer on staff now david gerald came back and novelized encounter at farpoint and sadly that's a whole soap opera there he had left the show by then but jerry was the only time the first time that a sitting writer on staff contributed one of the pro novels for pocket which was historic she said it about kilder doing that on top of but she wanted to stretch her muscles that way she was always you know improving herself and again i'm just so thrilled that after all those years went by and we didn't you know selfieing became a thing it sure wasn't back in the day but that's why i was so thrilled and blessed she was at star trek vegas a lot of you may have seen her 21 and then 2023 2021 more is a spotlight piece and lolita moderated through that i helped her backstage and I have some shots of her signing the big banners the way they do it at, at the creation cons. I missed seeing her in 2023 when they did a documentary uh, panel. That had a huge audience. I'm going to say I wanted to scream because she was on at 10 in the morning one of the days. And I have pictures of the audience. And the I'm sad to say the first time the audience was not large. And I had the same feeling anger tempered by sadness for all the fans who did not get that chance to see her it was the same thing when i helped get bob justman at the pasadena grand slams before vegas became a big thing and i want to say it was 0203 it was the last grand slam in pasadena before they tried him in burbank having bob justman there and i just want to run around the world's room screaming people you're not going to have this chance much longer come here this original touchstone to your Star Trek. But it was a thrill to see, it was a thrill to see Jerry that year. Finally, after all those years, and I made sure to get some, some shots with her. She was so sweet. Yeah, passing has just left us gobsmacked here. It was very sudden. She was had been doing well. Dementia-like symptoms happening more and more the last year or so. I'm so glad, so glad two and three and four years ago getting her on camera like this and getting just getting her back and getting her back in touch with fans directly like at Vegas. It's amazing sometimes for all the tragedy. I mean, people put in a long life too. People have a career and a long life, but it's amazing sometimes as our, as our pop media culture changes or our landscape evolves and now bonus features on a DVD are a thing. <laughs> Documentaries are a thing where they weren't, 20 years ago and 30 years ago. And uh, I'm just glad that sometimes things work out. I've always, I've always thought this time of year, I think it was September, but I've always thought we lost Aaron Eisenberg so quickly, so suddenly, 
so sadly. And he would be the first to say, well, he'd been on borrowed time for a long time, right? But I always thought how amazing it was that he had such a, a it wasn't planned, you know, so you're just organic with what you have to work with. But the way his bits in the DS9 documentary turned out, I thought, wow, with that spotlight bit and Nog as a captain in the in the seventh in the eighth season opener, uh, I just thought, what a what a what a great final chapter flourish to have to to have been able to do that and have it and be in time, and to have that timing so that that happened sooner than later or not at all, and uh, we're kind of there with Jerry. Um, obviously much more from back in the day, but uh, I'm just so glad, so glad she's part of, of all this now. And you will be too. And I'm, I'm excited. I've, I've only seen a couple of snippets from the Voyager documentary, but I'm sure, I'm sure everyone's going to be amazed and thrilled. And yes, it has been a wait, slowed down initially by the pandemic and then just everything coming out of that. But it's, it's on the landing strip. And we're going to get to see it, uh, the backers first, and then hopefully soon the world at large in all the ways. All right. So, yes, rest in power, Jerry Taylor. What an amazing life. Uh, the homemaker who conquered Hollywood and became <laughs> the mom of Star Trek for a time there and, and just launched so many voices help nurture and mentor so many voices that told us stories along with the stories she herself told just and gave us everything, everything that stands unique about Voyager. Uh, I'm going to say, let's, let's chalk it up to Jerry. Hey, I've got an unboxing gang to switch gears a little bit. We've got an unboxing. Uh, this, I don't know if you're up with it or not. I'm just going to open the the mailer here here i'll do it i'll do it the dramatic way all right and you need to know what's going on with it but look it is prodigy season two okay yes i know we're all waiting to hear what happens with season three but here is your season two unlike the first season where are they back there there's two discs for them this is everything on one disc Two never before seen featurettes. This is still coming from Paramount and CBS. So it's not a Netflix situation. They just are conveying the second season. They're not owning it. Anyway, uh, special features producing Prodigy, the Legacy, and the Odyssey of Prodigy, not the Prodigy of Odyssey. You know, we talk so much about. The way streaming has evolved so fast for everyone, I've, it's been like a, a kind of whipsawed around, right? It's it's there. We're all figuring it out, and then it's huge, and then it uh, declines. It goes in. People are still figuring out the business model, and meanwhile, we are being jacked around on where things are, how you can find them. People have come back around to realizing that owning physical media is the way to go if it's something you really care about and you don't want to put up with where you have to go. We just had the movies jerked around again. So you want to make sure if, especially if it's something that's near and dear to you, that you want to have it in your collection. This is coming out. You can pre-order now. It's going to be out early next month. I want to say November 12th. I should have that exactly. <laughs> it's coming up, but you can go however it is that you secure your DVDs, whatever the company is, Amazon or whatever your local, your Barnes and Noble, whatever, your local video store, does that exist? But sign up, get up, do a pre-sale order. And then, of course, as we play out this Netflix season three guessing game, things like DVD orders help. And it's timed just right to be part of the mix of discussion. I know it feels like it's been forever all these months since, but it was last Christmas when we got the debut of season two, but it never stops. Anyway, season two prodigy is up and all the tech specs are the same fine things you expect. Uh, I haven't opened this yet. Can't wait to get into it. This reminds me that season two has a big thumbs up from cadet Alice. We haven't aired the first couple of episodes we've, we've filmed yet. She's on board with it. And I know you are too. And prodigy has as many fans who have, who get it as it's ever had. 
and the body continues to grow. And hearing about how all the C how the series had to work together. Will uh, not spoilers, but Wesley Crusher's use on Prodigy predated the idea to use him on Picard <laughs> and start that whole that whole chain. So yes, season 2 Prodigy, it's out now or no, it's out now pre-orders now. It ships, it's out mid-November, and of course you want to get one. You want to get one so you can tell, you can depend on it being there when you want it, right? Because it's awesome. It's awesome. A lot of folks I know will say that the two animated series may be the purest and best track of them all. And, and we love you, Strange New Worlds. We love you, Picard Season 3. We love you later, Discovery, but top to bottom, start to finish, uh, there's a growing body of folks that say between Lower Decks and Prodigy, it may be the best, the easiest thing to show new folks. I know, go figure. Anyway, that is Prodigy Season 2 coming out. And thanks again to the powers that be for getting us a review copy. That's going to do it for today, gang. Just a final word about Jerry. She was so down to earth and so humble and so self self uneffacing is that a word it was a big thing for us a few years after we moved to la and jerry's still working actively on voyager before she retired a year or so i think we were able to buy our first home in la and had a housewarming party and of course Everybody nominally that we worked with was uh, invited, told. And that included Janet in the Heart Building. And lo and behold, didn't expect any of the top names to come by. That would have been nice, but didn't, weren't especially, weren't close, close. Janet worked, was there every day working with people. And you could tell, though, the work circle, right? Because lo and behold, who did come to our housewarming? Jerry Taylor. And one of the most precious things we have it doesn't have a delta on it. <laughs> no Starfleet markings, no legal lines. Uh, Jerry very sweetly got us a set of these martini glasses, four of them, as a housewarming gift. And every time we'd move <laughs> or even think about using them, it was like, don't break the Jerry glasses. This last move, once again, don't break the, I mean, these are little, these are little tiny stems, delicate crystal stems. So every time I see these, I think of Jerry. And not just think of Jerry and I thank her, but I'm like, she came to our housewarming. I mean, just that just tells you so much right there about how unassuming it was. That and the fact that I had we had to pry her. She resisted for years, but I had to pry her to acknowledge, to just look at to around and realize what an impact she'd had on Star Trek and its fandom. And so, so many fans, especially so so many young girls watching star trek and being affected just like so many people in all their ways watch star trek as a kid and they're affected thank you jerry just to let you know um who we need to thank as always and the thankers of course would be rttl club and i just realized i haven't done an update yet we'll do an update with the change of month but i want to thank all of our TTLers there, uh, they help add, add into the pile here. They put into the pot. I have a very simple, simple Patreon, but our TTLers, Chuck A., James Kerwin, Diana Hopkins, Jesse at Crusher Convo, Lawrence Todd, Helbert Gunn Johnson, Glenda Bruton, Andrew Jasimski, Josh Patton, Pranakasha Productions, Keith Rombach, Comedy Forecast. Thank you, Comedy. Uh, Chris Jiggins. And our TTL live wires. Yes. Robert McLean, Byron Bailey, J.R. Poole, Alan Huenzi, James, <laughs> Dave Gregory, Greg Wickstrom, and Casey Shafsky. Yes, indeed. How do you do a Patreon with me? It's very simple if you're familiar with the system or if you're not. Patreon.com slash Trekline Live. I have a very humble $5, $10 level here. I've just kept it at that as an add-on to everything else we do. It's very, it's growing slowly. I appreciate it. To me, it's just a way for folks who aren't part of anything else at Trekland can can be involved and support us if you'd like to. 
of course it's a Tuesday. And that means we're not quite to the season break yet. So that means it's another episode of the Trek Files. You want to hear this. He broke it on his own. But Dave Talata solved the mystery of where the three-foot Enterprise has been. Now, its, its status is still unresolved. But he's figured out where the three-footer went for all those years, how it wound up being in a storage locker accidentally found for auction. And it had nothing to do with Robert April, the visual effects folks who were fired initially on the motion picture. Yeah, you want to get this Truck Files. He's my special guest. As always, you can find it wherever fine podcasts are sold <laughs> or downloaded. Podcast.ron.com. The new home is thetruckfiles.com where you can get the reader and the uh the graphic, the, the document for the week, and also all the hot links back into Memory Alpha because it's a Memory Alpha page. Anyway, The Truck Files is awesome. Dave Talata and the mystery of the three-foot enterprise solved. He published it elsewhere on Fact Trek in his own blog, but I thought it was awesome enough that um, we needed to spotlight it. And we had a document, Gene's letter memo, asking everybody where it is. That's our file for the week. So you know, we're always going to be there. Hey, everyone, don't forget, it's a great time of year to come to LA if you're not already here for reasons and uh, take a Trekland Trek with me. It's your own customized away mission to actual Star Trek filming sites, over 50 on the list. You, with my help, pick out what four we want to see in a day, a six hour day. And we have an awesome time and hopefully it's really a once in a lifetime experience for you. And, of course, all the places. Larry Nemechek, I'm still on Twitter X, hang, holding on to the fort, doing some good there in an insane world. Larry's Trekland on Facebook, on Instagram, and here on YouTube. Please like and subscribe, ring the bell, would you please? And Portal47.net, you hear me talk about it all the time. Tomorrow is our guest of the month. The uh, Portales don't even know that our guest this month is Glenn Hambly, who was a four-year extra stunt alien, uh, or stunt or uh, alien alien, didn't do stunts, but very much a presence around the set for all four years of Enterprise. This is what I mean when I say Portal 47 is going to be for all the fans who have no idea how much Star Trek they have no idea about. That's going to do it for now. You want to stay with me. If you are watching us YouTube and leaving us now, let me leave you with just this. Just this. Please, please, please stay healthy. I just went today and got my new COVID shot. And guess what? They have an efficacy of six months now, not four months. This is going to take me right through cruise times next spring. So looking forward to the cruise. Uh, Voyage 8 uh, coming up in February. It is a sellout. But you never know. There's a wait list. If you're just bound, determined, and want to get in as they honor Voyager, but with guests from every aspect of the franchise and a lot of <clears throat> ambassadors along. I'm so excited. Uh, yes. Bottom line, though. Trek well, we're heading into the... Um, we're uh, <laughs> Stay healthy. We're heading into the winter season there. Do all the things, would you please? And above all, it is going to be insane the next few weeks. So, yes. Stay woke. Check your sources. Um, eyes open. I guess I'm saying, as always, truck well, everybody. Uh, Jerry. <laughs>